Good afternoon everyone and welcome to a webinar on looking at the role of e-health interventions in mental health and addictions treatment. My name is Alex Parker and I'll be moderating the webinar this afternoon. And the important things for you to know is that you can post some questions throughout the webinar for our presenter, just typing them into the chat panel at any time during the webinar. The presenter may be able to answer them during the presentation, but we'll certainly have some time at the end for some questions and answers. So it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Associate Professor Francis K. Lampkin from the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at the University of New South Wales to present for us today. So Francis has over 15 years experience in clinical research in exploring predominantly e-health interventions for people with comorbid presentations with mental health and substance use issues. She's led several large RCTs and been able to translate those research findings into practice. So very much looking forward to hearing what Frances has to present today on the role of e-health um, interventions in um, comorbid presentations. So thanks Frances and please um, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much Alex and thank you to everyone who's attending the webinar today to talk about an area in which I'm quite passionate so I hope to be able to communicate some of that to you today. Uh, but you've heard all about me and my professional background so uh, I'd just like to take a quick moment to find out about yours just via the first poll for today. Uh, so this is about to just take a few moments to let me know what your background is, um, whether that's clinician, whether it's teacher, educator and so forth, um, just so we know who we've got in the audience today. Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great we've got a mix of, of professional backgrounds and interests uh, here in today's session. So it's roughly half mental health clinicians, some community workers, we've got some researchers, we've got a few consumers in the group which I'm very pleased about and uh, also great to see some teachers and educators here too. Uh, thank you so much. So just by way of, uh, of background, I'll um, just take a quick moment to remind everybody about just how common mental health problems are in the Australian population. Uh, so in any 12 months we get around 20% of Australians who meet criteria, formal criteria for our strict uh, mental disorders and within that the third highest mental disorder that uh, people will report will be substance use problems. Um, and when we... Let's move forward. And when we think about um, substance use in particular and addictions in, in general, um, it's not just though the presence of those uh, disorders at that strict criteria level that causes um, problems or concerns for people engaging in those kinds of behaviours. So this slide is just demonstrating to you that um, if we forget about that strict level of dependence or disorder level for um, substance uh, dependence, we actually see that, that substance use and harmful use in particular um, is quite a lot higher than that roughly 12% that we see in the general population. So it really is a significant issue and runs across a range of different um, types of substances and across both males and females. And if we take it a little bit more broadly and look at um, alcohol-related harm over a lifetime, um, if we want to, uh, in any, any area of our lives, reduce the lifetime risk of harm from drinking alcohol, then we need to keep our consumption um, at, 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 under uh, two or more, two standard drinks on any one day in order to do what we call safe or, or low-risk drinking. And that's the same for both men and women. So in the research and the, the information that I'll present in the rest, rest of this webinar, I'm actually going to talk about people who consume in excess of these um, um, safe drinking guidelines or these uh, low-risk drinking guidelines and talk about the impact on functionality and, and so forth that comes along with drinking above these guidelines. And in particular, uh, you probably heard a lot in the media uh, at least about the issue of binge drinking, particularly as, as it affects our young people. So by binge drinking I mean it's a sequence of drinks taken without our blood alcohol concentration returning to zero in between and, and this consumption is a level likely to cause harm, whether in the immediate um, term or over time. And uh, in Australia at least, on one single occasion, um, those guidelines for binge drinking are around uh, four or more standard drinks. So the minute we drink more than four drinks on any single occasion, our risk of alcohol related injury immediately, but then over, cumulatively, cumulatively over the longer term, increases significantly. 
why am I here actually talking about these kinds of issues with alcohol or binge drinking and substance use uh, in, in general? And the reason is because these problems tend to have their onset um, in adolescence and this is the prime of people's lives. So although at some level it, it's kind of normative if you like for um, our young people to experimenting to be experimenting a bit with various risk taking behaviours including um, alcohol and other drug use, we do also see that it's around this time that people also start to have problems with the levels of their use um, across a range of their substances. And these um, disorders, these um, substance use problems tend to have their peak around the 20 year um, age mark and can continue for, for a lot longer and over the life course of people if these problems are left unaddressed. And certainly we also see that addiction is the number one cause of premature illness and death um, in this country and also internationally. And it contributes a major proportion to the disease, injury and unfortunately early mortality that we see across a range of our major health conditions, cancers, strokes, heart and lung diseases, um, dementia, HIV and hepatitis and also accidental and deliberate injury. The other important thing to remember when we think about um, addictions and substance use disorder is that often there'll be a number of behaviours that cluster together in and around a person's substance use or their decision to use substances. Um, and so you'll often see things like not just um, unhealthy substance use uh, or unhealthy alcohol use or unsafe substance use, but you'll also often see um, unhealthy diet, we see a lack of exercise and social isolation that can really cluster together and compound the impact that consuming those substances might have on their own for a particular person. And in particular, substance use will play a role in both the development and the progression of mental health problems. And we see that up to around 50% uh, of people with one mental disorder will meet criteria for at least one other mental disorder and often a physical condition as well. And by way of, uh, of, of, of population base in Australia, this means that, that every year around 340,000 of us will experience the combination of a mental health and an alcohol and other drug use problem. And if we include tobacco um, in what we mean by alcohol and other drug use, then this figure is much, uh, much higher. And again, unfortunately, we're seeing this uh, figure increase by about 10% from year to year. So why is this a problem, um, apart from it being um, exerting a significant impact on the individual who is uh, using alcohol or other drugs and also their, their immediate family and friends and so forth? But also we see an over-representation of substance use disorders in people with other mental disorders. So people are four times more likely to experience tobacco dependence um, if they have a mental disorder, two, twice as likely to get experience an alcohol use disorder, ten times more likely to have a cannabis use disorder and four times more likely to experience other drug use disorders. And I've just got some stats there on, on how common um, tobacco related uh, deaths are across our um, major serious mental illness just to give you some kind of, um, I guess, idea of what, how severe the consequences are um, of use of these types of substances. Um, in addition, comorbid substance use and psychotic disorders, for example, are also associated with significantly greater odds of, of heart disease, asthma, gastrointestinal disorders, skin infections and respiratory disorders. Um, and we see this not just in Australia, but we see this internationally as well. And the other alarming thing uh, from my perspective is that um, in Australia, as well as we see this internationally as well, the proportion of adults with a current mental disorder, including substance use disorder, uh, uh, who actually use traditional and available services, whether it be for a mental health problem or, or a substance use problem, really hasn't increased over the last uh, 10 years or so. And this is despite significant investment by the government, um, an annual investment of around $3.2 billion, including uh, um, facilitated and funded sessions for psychosocial interventions um, that, that try to encourage people to access traditional services for their treatments and it's also for their conditions and it's also in stark contrast to what we see in physical disorders where around 80% of people with a physical health problem will actually go and seek some kind of treatment to alleviate um, some of the, the symptoms that they're experiencing. We still haven't won those kind of battles in, in mental disorders and it seems to be be a little bit worse when we talk about alcohol and other drug use disorders. So if I use alcohol uh, disorder as an example, on average Australians will seek treatment 18 years after the onset of an alcohol dependence. 
and it's about 23 years after the onset of alcohol abuse. So this isn't just after a person's first drink um, or you know, a, a period of, of binge drinking, for example. This is actually 18 years after a, a formal alcohol dependence disorder has actually um, emerged in a particular person. And you can imagine that there's such a flow and effect during that time um, to a person's um, self-esteem, to their health and well-being, to their relationships, and their, to their abil ability to function socially um, and occupationally and otherwise um, in other aspects of their lives. And so over the, over the whole lifetime um, of uh, an alcohol use disorder, the treatment rate is only about 35%. And when people do access treatment, the current treatment coverage and the ability to, of people to access evidence-based treatment for their alcohol use disorder is only around 11%. And comorbidity, so the co-occurrence of, say, an alcohol use disorder with a mental disorder at the same time, um, actually compounds these issues. We see comorbidity um, quite a lot in our mental health and substance use settings. So whether or not we're actually assessing formally for, say, substance use in mental health settings or mental health and substance use settings, um, up to 90% of, of the people who come across um, the, path, the pathway of a service, the doorway of a service, will actually have a co-occurring mental health or substance use disorder. And the unfortunate thing about that, um, in addition to those high rates, is that when they are seeking treatment, it's really uncommon for people to actually get treatment for both their mental health and their substance use condition. So it's only around 30% with comorbid depression and substance use. And the net effect of this, of, of having um, untreated comorbidity, is that people with these uh, conditions actually um, have a poorer prognosis, um, they tend to be a bit more complex to treat, so their response to treatment um, isn't as good as it might be if they had one condition um, that they were presenting with, and as a result, uh, the, the experience of both the mental health and the substance use problem tends to be much more chronic and much more likely to relapse several times over a person's lifetime. So why is this the case? Why don't people seek treatment when they're um when the statistics at least tell us that they're experiencing um, all of these uh, impacts on their function, on their social relationships and on their health and well-being. Well, there are a lot of individual as well as structural determinants that will affect a person's ability and willingness to seek help through traditional means. So uh, in terms of individual determinants, people have to understand that, they, um, that what they're experiencing does meet criteria or does um, fit what we know about a mental health problem or a substance use problem, they have to recognise that there's something going on there. Um, they need to be open to the idea that services, whether it be mental health or drug and alcohol services, can actually assist them with their um, with their mental health concerns. Though there's still a lot of stigma out there um, in the real world about actually having a mental health and particularly a substance use problem. And things like time commitments can really affect a person's uh, ability to access our traditional treatment options. And a lot of people still prefer to rely on themselves. I think I can really do this myself, I don't actually need any help. From a structural or a system level, um, we do have limitations in the way that we can um, accommodate and support people, particularly with comorbidity in our existing treatment structures. The referral pathways aren't particularly clear, particularly if people are presenting with more than one condition at, at the one point in time, which happens to be the norm. Um, Treatment might not be, be affordable, geographical isolation might limit a person's uh, ability to actually get into a clinic and receive treatment, and also um, there might not be a, a range of services that a person sees as being relevant to them um, through these traditional means. And certainly this is something that the health system more broadly is recognising. Um, and so we're having an, a situation where we've got an increased healthcare service demands, we've got uh, costs associated with providing those services, particularly for mental health and substance use, and to some extent um, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare at least is suggesting that we're all already at the limits of our financial, physical and human resources. And so if we look to solutions that try to invest in more of these same kinds of approaches, um, we may not actually be successful in changing this situation much at all into the future. Uh, and again, particularly for comorbid mental health and substance use disorders, it's increasingly being recognised now as one of our health system's most significant challenges. And certainly the way that traditional services are, tend to be set up um, with a siloed approach, if you like, to say at least mental health and substance use problems, we really have to start thinking about um, creative, cost-efficient and effective ways to overcome some of these issues. 
So how might we actually go about doing that? Um, so before I talk about that, um, oh, I will talk about this a, a little bit more now. One of the potential solutions and why we're all here today is to talk about how e-health might have the capacity to respond to some of these issues. So by e-health, I mean a really this rapidly expanding field of health information and communication technology. So it's about this, this technology, whether it be the internet, by uh, you know our phones, apps, those sorts of things. Um, so that's what I mean when I'm talking about e-health. This is kind of a treatment or information that's um, transferred via these technologies. And why I think, uh, why we all think that um, e-health has really rose in it, risen in its popularity um, and, its, um, and its translation, if you like, into clinical and health related settings is, is a function of two things. So first of all, there's been a, a really widespread recognition within the health sector that e-health can play a critical role in somehow overcoming some of these barriers um, in our healthcare system that I've mentioned already. But along with this, particularly over the last 10 years or so, we've seen an increasing acceptance and also willingness for people experiencing uh, mental health and substance use problems as well as broader health issues to take a much more active role in protecting their own health and participating in their own health care. And I think these two issues particularly um, make it possible for e-health to, to really um, come in and make a difference um, in, this, in this environment. So I'll just get us all to pause there for a moment and I'll draw breath um, and ask you to consider our second poll, which is um, just very simply whether you have had experience using e-health in your own clinical practice um, or in your own um, information and fact gathering about mental health and or substance use. So please go ahead and, and answer the poll. Thanks everyone. I'll talk a little bit more about those results in uh, in a minute, but um, what people have generally said is there's about a third of us who, who haven't ever um, in, looked to incorporate this in our practice, whether that be our education practices or our clinical practices, um, but there's still around a third or so who have done it at least sometimes and again around 10% who've done it uh, frequently. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Thanks everyone. Uh, the other thing just to, um, I guess, bring us back to this issue of e-health is that it's not just this technology or this technolo technological developments. But when I'm talking about e-health, I'm also talking about uh, a state of mind. And I'm not just talking about this. This tends to be in, in uh, the technology field. It's not just about the technology, but it's about also having an attitude and a commitment to seeing how these types of technologies might actually work within our clinical practice or within the, the our own information and supporting our own health and well-being um, to really work out how well and where we think these things, um, these programs might fit. And it's being made um, so much more possible uh, by the pervasive use and access to the internet that we see, not just here in Australia, but uh, certainly internationally as well, and particularly in, um, in, in developed countries. And so in Australia, you'll see in the graph that when we are combined with our oceanic partners, we have internet access rates of around 73% of our population. And certainly if we look at Australia um, on its own, it's up around the 86% uh, percent mark. So a lot of people do have access um, to this kind of technology. And what we're also seeing is that traditional socioeconomic um, barriers that might limit uh, a person's ability to access treatments or to, to benefit from other kinds of innovation seem not to apply to access to the internet. So there seems to be no kind of digital divide, if you like, between those who have access to the internet and those who don't. And we um, have provided a little bit of evidence to that effect by about um, eight or nine years ago starting to ask people who came across our, our doorsteps to participate in our research trials uh, whether they actually had access to the internet and at what, um, at what rates they did that. So what you'll see from the, gra the figure in front of you, the table in front of you, is that for people with risky and harmful drinking, for example, and comorbid depression, we've got really high rates of access to the internet comparable to the general population. And even amongst people with um, psychosis, who some people may perceive might not have access to the same kinds of, of technology, um, we're getting really high rates of, of uh, access to the internet. And certainly around uh, the, the PTSD and the illicit substance using group um, in the last column there on the table, again, quite high rates of, of access to the internet. So um, there is a real potential for uh, internet delivered and e-health type interventions to reach people who might not be able to be reached by other uh, modes of treatment. And so if we think back to these um, uh, individual and structural determinants of treatment access, 
there, there is the potential for e-health, particularly in substance use disorders, to overcome some of these traditional barriers if we can actually deliver, develop and deliver types of treatments that are effective by this modality. And so that's what I'll talk about for the next part uh, of this presentation. Can we actually use technology to treat substance use and, and mental disorders? Currently, um, I'm sure uh, everybody here knows that there are a number of e-health treatments that are available, not just for substance use disorders, but for health and wellbeing and mental disorders and so forth. And there happens to be enormous variability between from program to program program from app to app and so forth. And I mean the wonderful thing I think about technology is that it's so accessible. But the other caveat is that it's so accessible and that just about anybody can work up a program, make a website or develop an app. And so as a, as a user or as a, as a broker of access to these e-health treatments, it really is important that we have a bit of an understanding about what makes a good app or what makes a good program um, and that we're using programs that actually do have an evidence base associated with them. So currently um, e-health treatments can be delivered on a device, a PC, a laptop, via app, even via text message or on the internet, which is a website. And uh, at the moment, if we have um, the programs I'll talk about live on a website, um, although I'll talk about some apps as well, and certainly on, the app, on a website we can, uh, we can actually have greater interactivity between the person using the program and the program itself. You'll also see e-health treatment packages that vary in the level of personal or real-time support that runs alongside um, these automated online um, or app-based programs. Now this person support can occur in a variety of ways um, as a clinician via email, phone, Skype, um, in person, in a chat room so, or so forth. It can be peer-to-peer -peer, and I'll show you some, um, some what I think is exciting research uh, using that in a moment. Um, but generally what we find is that um, unsupported automated um, online e-health programs generally are not as effective as those that involve some kind of support that are that run, runs alongside that program. So to my mind, and the evidence backs this up, that there will always be a role for a clinician, um, a peer supporter, a teacher and educator to be supporting and, and, and checking in with people about their progress and their use of these types of programs. So just keep that in mind for me as we go through. The next few tables will just start talk very quickly through the types of e-health treatments that are available currently as open access uh, programs, which means there's no uh, or little cost associated with uh, with using these programs, but importantly from my perspective being a researcher, these are the programs that do have an evidence base associated with them. So there's actually evidence from a research trial to show that these programs do do what they're claiming to do. And you can see from the, the table in front of you that there are some related to alcohol, there are some very effective ones for cannabis, um, and some for opiate use, use as well. Um, I'll, I'll just explain some of those acronyms if we need to. So MI is motivational interviewing, CBT is, is cognitive behaviour therapy and, and CM contingency management. And certainly generally if you find an online program that uses cognitive behaviour therapy, motivational interviewing um, and these types of approaches in the context of substance use, um, you can be pretty sure that they, um, they will be effective. Um, in a recent meta-analysis for the use of e-health uh, programs in alcohol. Um, the, again, we got some reasonably good effect sizes, um, which means a, a magnitude of effects um, of these programs in, in changing a person's consumption of alcohol use. And the important thing again to realise is that these changes are actually equivalent to what we see in standard traditional face-to-face -face therapies. So uh, again, uh, again, what I'm hoping you're beginning to see is that we are able to translate some of these messages um, for our effective treatments that we deliver face-to-face -face into these online e-health modalities. Um, and so I'm just wondering again if we can just pause and do do another poll. I'm a researcher, I do polls all the time. Um, just to consider whether, whether, whether and how you might think um, a clients who come across your doorstep um, might be interested in using e-health interventions. Do you think this is something that, that people generally who experience mental health and or substance use problems might be interested in doing it in your experience? Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. And generally what we're seeing is, is just about 60% of everybody thinks that, um, that their, their clients or the people experiencing these conditions would be um, at least moderate, moderately interested um, in, in using e-health interventions. And uh, so I'll come back to that again uh, in just a moment um, as, we, as we get through further into the presentation. 
Um, one particularly uh, effective and very well uh, researched online intervention is called CBT for CBT. This is developed by uh, a group uh, in the United States by Kathy Carroll and uh, funnily enough by the name it uh, delivers computer-based training for cognitive behaviour therapy via a self-guided automated web-based program that teaches uh, people who are experiencing um, or who are using um, illicit substances to understand their patterns of use, to understand and practice how to say no, to deal with cravings and to really um, analyse and challenge those thinking and decision making patterns that do lead to drug use. So if you're going to uh, uh, go away from here and, and check out any e-health programs in particular, I can really recommend giving this one, um, this one a little bit of time to work through. I'm going to talk a bit more specifically about some of the e-health programs that I've been involved in in developing and, and researching over the time that I have left. Um, and the first of which is one called Breaking the Ice, which was funded by the Commonwealth Department of Health and Ageing uh, to specifically address uh, the rise in crystal methamphetamine use that I'm sure we've all heard about, um, particularly in the last uh, year or so. Uh, colleagues and I out of the University of Newcastle um, in the early 2000s developed a, a really effective face-to-face -face, um, cognitive behaviour therapy and motivational interviewing intervention for amphetamine type stimulants, ATS, and it was the basis of, of that face-to-face -face program that we put into this Breaking the Ice online trial um, and conducted a randomised controlled trial, number one, to see if people using this particular substance would engage, would be interested in engaging in, in treatments uh, for, um, for this particular issue uh, and then to what effect. So this is what breaking the ice looks like. It's very motivational in, um, in its, uh, I guess it's weight if we had to weigh up motivational versus cognitive behavioural strategies, um, to try to engage a person who might be a bit ambivalent about changing their ice use because we know how, how powerfully addictive this particular substance is, um, but for any Anybody who has experience in, in this kind of intervention, you'll see all the usual suspects uh, that you might offer in any kind of evidence-based um, substance use intervention present in this one. So people um, weigh up their drug use, they uh, think about um, all the different areas of their life in which um, ice use might have an, have an effect and then get to think about what some of the good things or even not so good things might be about changing this current situation. We try to give people some practical steps they can do straight away or work towards over the course of completing the program. Um, and we tested the efficacy of this particular online program um, in a trial among 160 regular users uh, of crystal methamphetamine. So we did this about a year or so ago. Uh, we recruited people via the internet and via a lot of online forums related to substance use. So BTI is breaking the ice and we compared uh, people who were randomised to this online intervention to a control treatment um, that was just a wait list control. So people didn't receive anything during the um, three month period between baseline and three months when the other group were receiving their uh, online breaking the ice intervention. So we targeted current regular users of amphetamine type stimulants and we asked that those who were randomised to breaking the ice to um, complete three modules which were fully automated and self-guided so it didn't actually involve any interaction from a therapist or a real-time um, person or support person whilst they were making their way through the program. And this is just a, a bit of a snapshot of who actually enrolled in the study after we advertised on Facebook on those online forums. So what happened over the course of, of our study? Um, so what we see here is a, a graph comparing those in the orange allocated to the breaking the ice online intervention versus those in the control condition who were wait list and didn't actually have anything apart from their assessment. And here we have their um, uh, current levels of amphetamine type stimulant use at baseline zero months, at three month follow up and at six month follow up. And what you can see is that both groups reported reduce reductions in their amphetamine use over time um, and that we didn't actually get a treatment effect here. So there was, there was no significant difference in the amount of um, amphetamine use or the reduction in amphetamine use between our online intervention people and our wait list control. And I'll talk a little bit about why that might be in a moment. 
Um, when we actually had a look at people who completed the Breaking the Ice uh, program, um, and you might remember before I, I mentioned that it's only usually when in, um, you embed these automated online programs with them some support running alongside that you actually get people coming back and completing the modules and you get better outcomes. So we're thinking that in the future iterations of this uh, online program we might like to try that out because of this result. So what I'm going to show you now is um, some some statistics and results that actually show people uh, and differences between those who actually completed some of the Breaking the Ice uh, online treatment module versus those who did not. And for people who came back at least one time and completed at least one of the three modules, we actually had significant greater intended help seeking, the people who didn't, significantly greater actual help seeking for amphetamine use problems. So they were more likely to go on and engage in further treatment for their amphetamine use. And we also had a significant reduction in days out of role. So if people were able to perform their usual tasks and do what they felt was expected of them by themselves or others if they actually came back and completed at least one of our breaking the ice modules. So we're seeing a bit of a dose response um, effect here if we can get people coming back and completing the, these interventions. We asked the people who did do that um, what they thought about doing this kind of thing online, particularly around um, methamphetamine use. And certainly there are a few negatives that people could see with engaging with these types of e-health programs, uh, mainly around concerns around privacy. And incidentally, this is a really common concern about anyone accessing any kind of um, e-health kind of information, um, whether it be online or the apps. People do want to know um, who's having access to the information, who's provided and who's develop these uh, types of programs uh, and where their data will be stored. People are a bit bored in some parts of, of our intervention and because of the motivational language we, we were talking as though people wanted to change their, their amphetamine type stimulants and, and this was seen as a little bit of a negative. So we've got some ways uh, to modify this into the future. But importantly they um, nominated quite a number of positives. So they liked our case studies, um, they felt that it reduced their adverse drug effects, they would recommend it to other people in similar situations to themselves and they really did endorse this internet kind of delivery of of, these of this type of a program. And so we're encouraged that again this media is, is quite, uh, does have a lot of potential at least in the space of, um, of ice or crystal methamphetamine use. I spent a lot of time um, in the beginning talking about uh, complex problems and comorbidity and so and highlighting some of the issues people face in trying to, to access treatment or support for themselves that runs across the breadth of, of experiences and, and issues that they might like um, help with. And so again we think e-health can really play a role in overcoming some of those typical barriers if it can actually be effective, um, effective in doing so. And so we've done a bit of work out of uh, NDARC, National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, and also at the University of Newcastle to see if we can apply those same kind of principles to more co uh, complex and perhaps comorbid populations. So the first attempt at doing this for us was SHADE, so self-help for alcohol or other drugs drugs and depression. SHADE is a 10-week program, again, cognitive behaviour therapy, motivational interviewing. This has some mindfulness-based strategies in it as well. Um, and people complete one session a week over a 10-week period um, with some uh, clinical or therapist support running alongside of it. Um, so in our trial, we invited people to come into our research clinics and they uh, were randomised receive either a one session brief intervention and then nothing further, um, 10 weeks of, of psychological treatment delivered by a therapist, a psychologist, or 10 weeks delivered by this SHADE program supported with some short 10 minute check-in sessions uh, week to week. And here's a, a breakdown of who came into our trial um, and who then was randomised, or only in terms of their eligibility criteria of course, um, and then who went on and, and, uh, and completed various components of our program. Uh, we had roughly uh, half males, half females coming in who were around 35, 36 years of age. They'd left school at around about year 10 um, and were currently uh, at least part-time employment or, um, or studying um, or otherwise on some kind of benefit to support, uh, support their day to day. Um, importantly, we were able to show that uh, by using the SHADE online uh, treatment program, people were able to make good use of, of the treatment content and they reported reductions between baseline and three months in their 
levels of depression, their symptoms of depression that they were reporting. And although between baseline and three months, this was significantly a little bit higher for people who had the therapist delivered treatment, um, over the course of 12 months, um, regardless of whether you received the face-to-face -face therapist treatment or the shared computer treatment, you made roughly equivalent improvements movements in your depressive symptoms, uh, which is pretty exciting really. Um, and this is in contrast to the brief intervention, the one session intervention um, group, who did make some improvements importantly, but these weren't quite of the same magnitude as people who received this extended um, uh, online or face-to-face -face therapy program. We also had a look at people who met criteria for alcohol dependence at entry to our study in this particular sample. Um, and what we see here is a slight benefit for people who uh, received a face-to-face -face, uh, therapist intervention um, over the longer term, but we still do get significant improvements, significant reductions in uh, consumption of alcohol between baseline and three months and then over the longer term for people who receive that computerised treatment program. And we also had a, a good effect for people who receive this one session brief intervention. And you also see this in the alcohol use literature as well. But what's important about this is that people with a comorbid presentation who arguably might have a more complex and potentially chronic relaxing um, experience of both the depression that they have and, and uh, their alcohol dependence, they can actually still benefit from uh, a brief intervention um, and make use of a, a computerised intervention um, over the short and long term. For cannabis dependence, this is just showing the results for people who met that criteria for, for cannabis dependence at, uh, at study entry. Again, we see a benefit here of the therapist delivered and the shade delivered cognitive behaviour therapy over this brief intervention. And uh, particularly for that the green line there, the shade computerised therapy group, uh, people who are cannabis dependent actually seem to benefit more and a little bit more quickly if they had their treatment delivered via the computer program. Uh, and so that's a really interesting result, suggesting that there might even be a potential, a further potential benefit for computerised or, or e-health in the context of, of cannabis use and depression. We asked the people uh, who came through our trials themselves uh, what they thought about the treatment, what they thought about the three different treatments that they were, on, that they were offered. And we have some indication that they found um, their experience acceptable. So in terms of treatment attendance, so the number of sessions attendance, attended and uh, their ability to then follow through and, and complete assessments over the longer term, we had no significant differences between the therapist and the computer delivered conditions. And importantly, no differences in the therapy therapeutic alliance or the extent to which people felt they were bonded um, or engaged with, with their treatment. Um, and that was regardless of whether treatment was uh, delivered by their therapist or by this computer. And importantly for people who were in the computer or the shade condition, they rated themselves significantly higher on this, issue, this domain of client initiative, which really is feeling like they're setting the direction for themselves in therapy and that they're responsible for, for making changes and, and taking that direction and leading therapy. And it's not too hard to imagine that if you're not having a therapist working with you intensively, that you feel like you're doing this a bit more in a computer condition. What was interesting for us though is that people who were high on this actually did better in terms of their alcohol use outcomes um, than people getting that face-to-face -face treatment. So again, maybe some benefits here uh, for this for the shade computerised treatment in this context. We've replicated these findings in a larger trial involving almost 300 people and we are now using um, shade in the UK, in the USA and Northern Europe. We're yet to really crack uh, the use of shade here uh, in, in Australia so I'd be interested to hear if anybody has uh, any ideas about where and how this kind of a program might fit um, in their particular context. We've also produced a, a, a younger person's in terms of its look and its feel um, of shade that deals specifically with depression and binge drinking. And you can see that this does have quite a, a different look and feel from the original graphic that I showed you. And instead of offering um, uh, real-time clinician support on a weekly basis, in this particular um, uh, version of SHAPE, the DEAL program, we are also offering people access to this breathing space community, which is kind of like a Facebook social network, if you like, just specifically for people who are completing this DEAL online program. And what we're doing at the moment is examining in a, in a big trial the extent to which something like this is beneficial for people, for young people particularly, experiencing 
experiencing depression and binge drinking concerns, not only in taking up and using more of that online automated deal program, but also perhaps in, in maybe encouraging them to make further changes um, in terms of their binge drinking practices and, and hopefully feeling a bit better um, in terms of their mood. What we're finding is really interesting for mine, and that is that um, rather than being used like Facebook to post your breakfasts or your lunches or your dinners or, or so forth on, what people are using using this community for is actually to seek support in times of need and crisis. And they're preferring to do this rather than to talk to us on a, on a phone line, which we make available to people whenever they need it. So this quote here and um, is indicative of, of some of the people who are using this breathing space community, and I'm using this with, with permission of uh, the person who made the post. And they're really um, thinking that the best way to actually talk through their problems or to resolve some crises is to do this, so to, to write or to post on this type of community. Because this person can't imagine the words leaving their mouths. And even if we as clinicians or, the, or moderators, be they peer moderators or, um, or cl clinical other moderators, can't respond straight away when a person posts, it doesn't seem to be as important as actually being able to have a, a forum to get their side of things out. Um, because they struggle to talk about it. So we're really seeing, I think, um, potential for these types of technologies to have uh, a real impact, particularly on perhaps the, uh, this younger age group for this particular trial of 18 to 30 year olds. We've also developed a, a serious game version um, of some of the aspects of the Shade and Deal program, which I'm happy to talk about if, if people are interested a little bit later on. And we've extended the reach of some of our uh, of the Shade program to include um, not just um, uh, um, alcohol and other drug use issues, but other kinds of unhealthy lifestyle behaviours that um, people with depression particularly are telling us that they would like some assistance with. We've developed this I Help Healthy Lifestyles program which helps people who, who are smoking tobacco, who are having um, issues uh, getting motivated for physical activity and exercise and also um, struggling to eat a healthy diet if you like, to work through some modules that can teach people how to do this and help, help um, um, give rise to that motivation that it might need to make some changes to some of these lifestyle domains. We've run a very, very small pilot trial for people um, uh, via Facebook again uh, to, to see whether the iHelp program actually does what we hope it will do. Um, and our initial uh, results, which you can see here for smokers with depression, uh, around 60 of them, um, seem to indicate that again, um, this eHealth program with email-based support can actually help people make real change in their real lives across a number of domains. So we're seeing here we're getting significant reductions in the number of cigarettes people are using, uh, reporting using per day. People are able to um, significantly increase their vegetable serves per day and they're reporting significantly reduced levels of, of depression, even though iHelp doesn't actually target depression. So there seems to be a flow and effect to um, um, adopting maybe some, some healthier behaviours um, and a, a person's mood. And we're also getting tobacco abstinence rates um, at six months of about 17%, which is what you tend to see in the big um, smoking studies in the general population. And so uh, I know this has been quite a, a, a quick um, uh, run run through the, the e-health that's available, but what we're beginning to see is some real evidence of how these programs, when uh, particularly when supported by real-time clinicians or peers, uh, is, is quite effective. And so the use of, of e-health initiatives, particularly in substance use treatment, but also as we're starting to see in comorbidity, seems to be more of a question now of costs and, and, and the the preferences of providers and of clients than it is maybe of, of efficacy or the ability of the technology to do what we think it might be able to do. And uh, I guess that's why I asked those uh, two poll questions um, previously about the extent to which you're willing to integrate or you have been using these sorts of things things that you think clients might be able to, um, to do so. Because what we're starting to see is a, a bit of a gap emerging between um, what clinicians think, they, think their clients might actually want to do or be be prepared to use and what people themselves are actually willing to use. So we've done a very small study about this in, um, in a, a substance use setting uh, in New South Wales where I'm from uh, and although 80% of, of the people coming across that, um, or coming through that particular service said they'd be willing to use e-mental health, they would like to use the SHADE program to help supplement or augment the care they're receiving, only 34% of their clinicians uh, um, 
only 34% of clients were actually exposed to these um, treatments by their clinicians. So I think um, that, that's just food for thought, and, but based on the poll results, we actually uh, didn't see that kind of a disparity in the group here, which is, which is really encouraging. So hopefully, um, in summary, um, if you haven't already, we um, might have convinced you that e-health is worth a try that many treatments, particularly when combined with clinician support or peer support, are as effective as face-to-face. -face. And there are some of the, the key ones which have demonstrated in you know, head-to-head -head comparisons with a face-to-face -face treatment to be um, as effective uh, as their face-to-face -face alternative. That people themselves find it as acceptable as face-to-face -face treatment, and particularly more so for some conditions, like some issues like cannabis use treatment, and maybe for young people as well. We know that people have access to the internet um, and so we, we know that we can actually get this, these programs um, to that point of care for people um, who might benefit the most from them. And also that potentially clinicians can use it to save time and perhaps offering um, a bit more augmented care or more specialised treatment, potentially with little change to, uh, to usual practice. So thank you so much for, for coming along today and I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and colleagues, of, of whom there are many, um, and I'd welcome any questions. Thank you. So we've got a couple uh, of questions coming through already, which really excites me. So the first one is, um, are currently any of these applications available to the public, or are they still in the process of research or publication? That's a really, really good question. Um, so I, the, the, pro the programs that I specifically spoke about um, aren't actually in the public domain yet, mainly because we're still working with services and clinical providers to, to work out where in that clinical pathway these particular programs sit. But what I'm really happy to do is for anybody here to email me using the email address that you'll see on your screen now, and I can give you all um, individual access to these programs. So you can have a bit of a look and feel, um, and you can see, you can use them with some of your clients, and you can um, you see, see how they go. Um, but certainly the other ones that I mentioned today are actually in the public domain. The second question is a really good one uh, as well. So how do you train peer moderators and mitigate risk in online support communities? So um, certainly um, this, is a, this is a critical issue. Uh, in, in the context that we have, we have uh, a code of conduct that participants in our community sign up to. Uh, we have um, uh, regular supervision sessions, not only with the clinicians who moderate this uh, online space, but also the peers who support, um, uh, support uh, others going through these types of programs, just to talk about um, issues of concern, um, concerning posts, um, concerning um, potential uh, people in the community from a risk perspective. We also have automated word searches that go through um, our online network, our social network, um, that, that will um, alert us to um, the presence of any um, suicidal crises behaviour or people disclosing some traumas which may be uh, maybe have an impact on the wider community. Um, our clinician moderators moderate between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. And then we have other clinicians based in the US who actually monitor the posts as well um, and can provide support to our peer moderators um, when we're all asleep here in Australia. Um, so outside of those hours, that partnership's been very good. Um, and also um, doing some, uh, I guess, mental health first aid type training with um, the peers who we then um, uh, co-opt and, and agree to support this network so that they can feel that they have, um, I guess, the skills that they might need to, to, to respond to some posts if we're not, don't happen to be there. Um, someone else has just said it's really interesting that only 34% of clinicians exposed their clients to shade. I was quite surprised as well. And um, and what might I what do I think are some of the barriers to clinicians using this in technology, and how how can we tackle some of those barriers? Um, I don't know if it's simplifying the issue, but I honestly think um, the clinicians in talking to me, it was more about them not thinking that their clients actually would be willing to use this type of, of intervention either as an adjunct um, to, uh, to the clinical care that they're receiving or as, you know, as, an, as an alternative. So uh, we worked with this particular service for about two years to show them the program, to talk about where and how it might fit in, and we still only got 34% exposure. And so, we, and so I, I actually do think it's about giving um, 
giving the people accessing these services the opportunity, whether we think as clinicians they'll take it up or not, um, to use these types of treatments and, and kind of any innovation that we think is worthy. Um, I also think perhaps potentially issues around um, privacy and confidentiality um, still remain um, important. And so if I'm a clinician and I'm talking about these types of programs um, with a person, then I'll be sure to talk about um, not only evidence-based but also um, you know, about how, those, how the data is being collected and monitored and, and so forth. Um, and at the risk of saying more education, but I think uh, you know people in in my field and the health field have a real responsibility to to try to set some standards and to offer people um, training and advice about what makes a good program, how you might actually have these discussions with with a client who probably is already using a lot of this sort of stuff anyway. And my clients know much more about technology than I do. Um, but so, so to, to have some resources available to facilitate those conversations if clinicians are wanting to take them on board um, and, and implement them in their own clinical practice. Um, and so certainly the next question is how should clinicians prepare themselves to support their clients in using e-health interventions? And I do think um, this is it's a really nice opportunity to, to, to enter into a genuinely collaborative relationship with the person that you're supporting with a mental health or, or a substance use issue. Um, I tend to... Um, uh, I'll be a bit clumsy sometimes with the technology as I am with words sometimes. Uh, but in this context I often say, look, I've heard about this terrific uh, program, uh, I know that the evidence is sound but I don't know how to use this. You know, What do you think about this? Do you mind taking it home and, and giving a bit of a go and maybe coming back and telling me what you think and, and maybe telling me how you think um, we could use this together in, in the time that we've got together. So I think, um, you know, being willing to collaborate genuinely with um, the person that you're working with in that therapeutic environment goes a long way um, to preparing you to support them through that process and just being prepared to, to answer questions and, and making yourselves and ourselves familiar with the content of these types of programs that we're then recommending in much the same way as we would a self-help book. Um, we've also got a question now about what is the cost, if there are any specific um, e-health options for under 18 year olds and, and this is a really critical uh, critical question as well. So for the programs that I've mentioned coming out of, of, of my group, there is no cost associated with using those programs. Um, so again, emailing me gives you free um, access to those particular uh, programs. Um, we just don't have the capacity at the moment to, to upscale our network and support you know, the millions of people who potentially could um, could access this program. So we're just doing it on an uh, individual basis at the moment. Um, but the other programs that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this presentation are actually again, in the public domain. And certainly the ones in Australia, and particularly um, other ones I didn't mention, like Mood Gym um, and uh, through the Swinburne Group uh, down uh, in Swinburne, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Victoria now, I keep forgetting I'm in Victoria, um, have a range of, of programs that are available. Uh, there's the This Way Up clinic also, where these are online programs are free of charge. And if you want some support, uh, some clinician support running alongside them, then you can pay an additional cost to have that happen. Um, and certainly there is the Brave online program for uh, anxiety for people under 18 years. Um, and the, the DEAL program and, and the breathing space that I spoke about, it's for people, we've kind of aimed at, we're doing our trial with people 18 years or over, but it's really, uh, could probably um, translate pretty well to people sort of 16 years or over and starting to have their first experience um, with, with mood problems or binge drinking. There's also a new online portal that we've launched called Positive Choices and they uh, include some resources linked to um, secondary high school curriculum uh, that are around drug and alcohol information, um, drug and alcohol support services, drug and alcohol fact sheets. Um, and there are sections on there with information for parents and information for students um, and school age students, so secondary school age students who are wanting to find out more about these types of things and also as I said tips for teachers linked to curriculum, national curriculum codes about how you can integrate that into your clinical practice and the Climate Schools program is also uh, a great one for the prevention of, of substance use disorders and, and mental health disorders in young people. Okay, I'll hand back over to Alex. Thank you so much for having me and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much, Francis. Well, for a fantastic presentation and for getting everyone interested in thinking more about e-health interventions and how they can be integrated into practice. And I think the importance too of 
knowing um, who's produced that product and that it is evidence-based and it's been researched and we can trust and, and it's got credibility in that source as well. Um, thinking about those outcomes too to know that um, you know, using these programs in conjunction with or embedding it with clinical support does actually lead to better outcomes for the people using those um, online programs. So it's still it's really positive to know how we can integrate technology into our clinical practice. Thanks again, Francis, for your time today and for this fantastic webinar. Uh, for anyone that uh, has any further questions, I do apologise, I'm having some trouble moving on to the next slide, but I had some information too about upcoming webinars. So we've got uh, one that's looking at um, engaging young people in youth mental health services um, or looking at early warning signs of young people um, exhibiting mental health issues. That's coming up on Monday um, the 14th of December. And also just to let you know that you can find more resources on the ORIGIN website to follow up if you've got any um, further, further questions or looking for further information that you can find it there. So thanks very much for participating today everyone. Oh, thank you, I've got the screen happening now. Um, and also just to remind you too that we've got a certificate in conjunction with the Young and Well um, CRC um, in Young People's Mental Health and Technology. So that online course is now available for, for clinical um, psychologists and also for um, mental health um, professionals working with young people. So there's two streams, they're available online that people can work through those modules as well. So thanks very much for joining us and that was the webinar that I did mention that will be available um, that will be on on Monday at 1 o'clock looking at the early warning signs of mental ill health in young people. Thanks very much for your time.